Good morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you do for us. We thank you for the blessing of a new day. God, I pray that you'd bless our time together this morning. Lord, the world is still seemingly in chaos. And Lord, we know that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you. We know that you're the only answer for all the problems of this world today. And pray that you would bless us, help us to find those answers within your word, the living word, and the written word as we share together in worship this morning. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Before we get started with the message this morning, I want to bring some songs to you. Uh, the music this morning was recorded live uh, this last week at North Carolina at the Billy Graham Training Center at the Cove in Asheville, North Carolina. And Donna and I got an opportunity to spend three days there in a wonderful conference with Ron Hutchcraft. Uh, a great program uh, that they put together, beautiful place, wonderful food, uh, and a great conference that we got to learn uh, healing through hurt and through pain and broken hearts. You know, so many people are hurting. Uh, we all have brokenness. We all have hurts. We all have pains. But we also know people that have those things and they need help. And in our ministry, we run into that a lot. And so that was a great conference for us to go to. But while we were there, I was able to uh, record some uh, songs in a beautiful chapel that was designed by Ruth Graham herself and decorated by her. Beautiful pi yellow pine floors, uh, reclaimed uh, wood everywhere, beautiful pews, beautiful woodwork. You'll get to see a little bit of that today as we uh, go through the time of worship. Together, we'll begin with some music from the Billy Graham Training Center at The Cove. <laughs> I saw him one warm, bright Sunday morning outside the drugstore. He leans on the wall all by himself. The cars just pass by him, and no one really sees him at all. When right down the street, in a pretty white building, we gather together and breathe. Thank you, Lord, for our blessings and forgive us our many sins. God help me today. At a house down out in the front yard three little children together at play they're ragged and dirty and the cars just pass by them and no one even gives them away when right down the street in a pretty white Gather together and free. Thank you, Lord, for our blessings. Forgive us our many sins. God help the children today. Why can't we see them? Oh, why can't we help them? We travel. Our life's busy way Went right down the street In a pretty white building We gather together and pray Wouldn't it be nice If the man and the children had someone stop and ask them to come to church Sunday morning. Stop by and even bring them as we pass by on our way. Went right down the street in a pretty white building. We 
Gather together and breathe. Thank you, Lord, for our blessings and forgive us our many sins. And God help the needy today. God help the children today. Right down the street in a pretty white building, we gather together. Stroking his cheek, 
and hold in his hand his fever's breaking just at the breaking of day while the sun's coming up she puts her baby down her soft voice is the oldest son her husband hears as she kneels and quietly prays for rest for her weary soul rest to make her baby whole rest from the storms and trials of her life and his little life rest heaven's bomb comes down rest she can hear the sound like a band of angels bringing peace and rest He sits by the bedside, face in his hands. She is his lady, and he is her man. He sees the love of his life, and she's slipping away. He knows she won't be here very much longer while she's getting weaker. He's got to be strong. He kneels beside her bed. And he cries as he prays For rest For her weary soul rest To cleanse and make her whole rest From the storms and trials of her life Her long life Rest Heaven's bomb comes down Rest We can hear Sound like a thousand angels bringing peace and rest. The prayers of the righteous are heard by Jesus, each and every sound. He whispers them softly in the ear of his Father, who sends his mercy down with rest. For our weary souls rest To cleanse and make us whole Rest from the storms And trials of our lives Each and every life Rest, heaven's bomb comes down Rest, we can hear the sound Like a choir of angels Bringing peace and rest Oh, like a band of angels Bringing peace and rest Oh, like a thousand angels Bringing peace and rest you've got your Bible, if you turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, we're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 through the 27th verse. Uh, just a few passages there, a few verses, just to uh, continue a little bit of what we've been studying the last uh, couple of weeks, what we've been looking at in our worship time together in 1 John. Um, next week, we'll diverge from that just a little bit and uh, do a, a special service that, that I'm going to be doing somewhere else, and we'll record that and put it up next week. But uh, this week, we're going to be continuing in a little bit of a series, not a formal series, but we're kind of going through some of the books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, uh, briefly through 2nd and 3rd John, but we will be going through 1st John a little more intensively, a little more intense of a book. Um, today, when we're, we're looking at this, we're, we're reminded that over the last uh, few weeks as we've begun looking at 1st John, we have, we have sort of continued in that idea to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. We've been harping on that for a long time, and I don't think you can harp on that uh, too much. You know, Jesus took all of those volumes of commandments, all of those books and, and volumes of commandments from the Jews, and they had all these rules. It said rules that they couldn't keep, 
uh, rituals they couldn't uh, adhere to, and all of it was was set up for the people to fail, set up to keep them under control and under under spiritual poverty. And Jesus is saying, there's no place for that mess. It all narrows down to not just the Ten Commandments, but two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, all of the law and the prophets rest on those two things. And so we're carrying on with that as we go into 1 John, and he talks about we must love one another. We cannot not love each other. We're not allowed that. We are not allowed to divide across racial lines or gender lines or denominational lines or even upon uh, different beliefs in religion or people that don't believe at all in God. We, we can't draw a line and say, I can't love that person because they don't believe in God, or I can't love that person because they're a different color skin than me. That is preposterous. The, the word of God in these passages prior to this in the first chapter says that can't be. And if somebody says that they love God, says they trust God, says they believe in God, but then they hate their brother, they're a liar. They're a liar. It goes on to say that you can't tell your brother that you love them, and then let them keep on sinning. If you really love them, you will point out to them what God's word says is sin. Now, I'm going to say this again, and I've said it time and time and time again. <clears throat> we have been in a situation time and time again where people will throw back at us, not me, not necessarily my wife, but you and I as Christians, a lot of times people will throw up back at you Hey, you're not perfect. You did this. I remember when you were a kid, you were a beast. I get that. <laughs> I remember when you were a kid, you did this. I remember when you were a kid, you did that. I remember you said this one time. You said that one time. Just because I am not perfect, just because I sin, just because I have faltered or I have fallen at times in my life, does not negate the fact of what God's word says. It does not negate God's word because I have sinned. It does not negate God's word because you have sinned. It doesn't wipe out what God has said in his word because we are not perfect. God chose a lot of imperfect people to present his word to the, to the world. Even though I am imperfect, even though you are imperfect, we are called to love one another enough to call each other out, to say, look, that's not right. You shouldn't be doing that. That's not, a, that's not a right way to be. You've got to live in accordance with God's word. You've got to love him. And if you love him and you love me, you will do what his word says. And part of that is pointing each other to the right direction. If I'm doing something wrong and a Christian brother says to me, comes to me and says, hey, that's not right. You shouldn't do that. Then in humility, I should say, you know, you're right. Forgive me. And ask God to forgive me and stop doing that. But we can't keep living in sin, and so we can't keep being a part of this world and, and follow along with the way the world wants us to follow and, and say it's okay because we're saved and we have grace. Remember, we're not saved because we behave ourselves. We behave ourselves because we're saved. That is our worship to God, to be holy because he is holy. And so when we say that we love someone, we will tell them the truth, even if it means that it hurts their feelings because we tell them that what they're doing is wrong according to God's word, not my opinion, God's word. I didn't write this stuff. <laughs> God did. I do have uh, a couple of things that I would like for us to talk about uh, today, things that uh, may be a little bit, little bit hard to deal with with some people. Um, there's a... Uh, a passage here where it talks about the Antichrist. The people get all crazy uh, when we talk about the Antichrist. People get, people get crazy when we talk about that stuff, all right? They start getting real, um, real, some of them people get cocky because they think they know it all. Some people get real defensive because they don't want to hear about it. Make no mistake. Whether the Antichrist comes now and the tribulation begins and we're raptured or we're not raptured or whatever, regardless of what that happens now or if it happens a thousand years from now, the people that are living when it happens are not going to believe that it's actually happening. There are going to be many people that will be in denial. 
They will say, nah, it's not going to happen in our, oh, that's not really happening. You just think that's happening. This is not the mark of the beast until they have it. And then it is. But let me tell you something. If you trust God, if you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, you're not going to have to worry about all that stuff because Jesus Christ is going to walk you through it. We win on the other side, all right? But it says in those passages, it says children, in verse 18, it, it is the last hour, okay, the last hour. We're coming to the last times. Things are coming to an end. This is what Jesus is saying. Now, this is a long time ago, all right? So you need to remember that God's word in 2 Peter says, to the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. Time means nothing to God. We, we are all caught up in time and money, and neither one is important to God. He does not care about time or money because he owns all the time and all of the money. He has all the time in the world plus eternity, and he has all the money in the world. He doesn't need money. Money means nothing to him. And so it says, it is the last hour as you have heard that Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Okay? Don't get hung up on that. Just hang on. We're gonna, he's going to explain this. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour because he said Antichrists Antichrists have already come, okay? This is John telling the people, he's writing his letters to the people. He was the one that was probably the closest to Jesus. Jesus told us this was going to happen. John is just telling us what Jesus had already told us, what Jesus had told him, and he's, he's reiterating that to us, all right? They went out from us. This is, this is the catchy one. This, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. Okay? Now, now right there, before we get a whole lot farther, think about the world that we live in. Think about the things that we're hearing in the last 15, 20 years. Things that we used to be abhorrent to. Things that used to um, completely um, disgust us because of the power of God in our life are celebrated on this earth. Jesus told us about how we should live moral, decent lives. God's word tells us morality and decency and the right way to live the world has taken all of those things that God planned and all those things that God wanted for us in our behavior and in our, our love of one another, and he's twisted it, and he's perverted it, and he's made it completely different. Because it's a fallen world, we fall into that trap of sin that leads us into those places, all right? But there are those who have crept into the church, the body of Christ, and have begun preaching things that are, that are not true, that are not of Christ. They're not right. And so we have to be very, very careful when we come to a place where we listen to other preachers or other teachers or other people in authority or celebrities or whatever. When they start quoting scripture, you better make sure they're not quoting it out of context. Now, because of this, and because we come to the end times and prophecy is part of it, and we come to the time where we start listening to these people because we want to hear what's going on. We don't, excuse me, we don't like what's going on. We don't understand what's going on. And so sometimes we try to make the end times, the tribulation, the antichrist, the rapture, part of everything we hear in the news. That's also dangerous. I believe that's going to come about, and we're going to see all that stuff taking place. And I believe we're getting to the end times. But we have to be very, very careful not to overdo our thinking in that direction. I have, um, for years, heard a teaching. I don't know exactly where it originated. I've tried to source that back, but I keep hitting dead ends as to where this guy or this guy or this guy or this guy heard it. It keep, 
I think I know where it came from. I think I know the first person that probably said this. And I know that um, they have said other things over the years that were just a little bit out there, a little bit crazy. Uh, they have prophesied things that did not come true. But I don't know for sure that that is the person that said this, but I believe that that's where it came from. Nevertheless, I have heard it beginning in the early 90s. I began hearing this. I heard it from one guy, and, and I, I believe I can trace it from him back to the one I believe that said it first. And then I heard later other people that I knew studied under that guy and then other people that have heard those guys, and it has it is sort of grown, okay? This is a prophecy that I heard years ago, okay? There was a man named Smith Wigglesworth. And Smith Wigglesworth was considered the great, uh, or the grandfather or the father of the modern Pentecostal movement. Okay, in the mid-1800s, he was a preacher in the British, British Columbia, or uh, the UK, United Kingdom, and he was an evangelist uh, of the Pentecostal persuasion and denomination. He was very revered, very respected, okay? And he was a great preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He spoke great words of, from, from the Word of God, great sermons. I heard years ago that he said this, standing on a beach looking off to the west towards America, that the last great awakening on this earth was going to come among the American cowboy. And I've heard that for years. Well, I'm a curious person. You know, I'm like, hey, that's cool. man. That's, that's awesome. Man, I want to hear more of that. I want to hear more of what that guy has to say. And I got a book, and it is a definitive book by Desmond Cartwright about the life and ministry of Smith Wigglesworth. I read that book, and I started reading other things that I could find that were writings and sermons of Smith Wigglesworth, and I could not find anything about that prophecy. So I looked at that book, and I realized that in that book, the, the foreword of that book was written by the son of Desmond Cartwright. And so I tracked him, because I figured by now Desmond Cartwright's dead. Desmond Cartwright was a curator of the museum of the modern Pentecostal movement. He is considered by Pentecostals worldwide as the definitive uh, authority on the Pentecostal movement and on Smith Wigglesworth. So who else to write but his biography but him? So I, I went to his son, Smith uh, uh, Desmond Cartwright, Jr., Desmond Carrat II, and I wrote him an email. I tracked him down. He was at a college in the UK. I wrote him a letter, and I asked him what uh, there was about that. I wanted to know more about that. I wanted to know information about that prophecy because it sounded so phenomenal. How, how, what a great prophecy that was in light of what God had called me to and what we were doing. And I got this letter back, not from Desmond Carrat Jr., but from the old man, Desmond Cartwright himself, who wrote that book, who knew of everything that Smith Wigglesworth had preached and said. Okay, I want you to, I'm going to read the email that that great man wrote back to me. He said, Thank you, dear Jeff, thank you for your question. You are not the first that has asked. It can be said categorically that there is no evidence that such a prophecy was ever delivered by Wigglesworth. I offer this by way of evidence, remembering that there, it is impossible to prove a negative. Number one, I searched all of the recorded sermons and other details of reports of many of his meetings. The word cowboy was never mentioned. More importantly, Wigglesworth did not believe that predicted prophecy was to be used in that manner. We'll talk about that in just a minute. He suffered from the misuse of prophecy, and he put in, in quotation marks, 
and had personal words spoken against him that resulted in him losing his own assembly at Bradford. And Wigglesworth did believe that there would be a revival in the work of God before the Lord returns. His belief was based on the promise of God contained in Scripture. This was called the more sure word of prophecy by Peter in 2 Peter 1.19. And we'll look at that in just a minute. May the Lord revive his work in every place. We are enjoying the raindrops, but we need a deluge. God bless you, Desmond Cartwright. Now listen, I say this, and I tell you all of this, not so anyone who has ever said that that happened would feel bad or be, I'm not knocking it. I have said, after I heard that, I said that a few times, that that had happened, only to think, I need to check that out and get more details about that. And when I investigated and when I delved into the facts, I found out that it did not ever happen. Predicted prophecy in this way is like telling a fortune. It's like reading the future, telling the future. This is what's going to happen in the future. That is not biblical scriptural prophecy because biblical scriptural prophecy is talking about Jesus Christ coming back to this earth. That's the prophecy that, that Smith Wigglesworth used. That and prophetic preaching, which is always repent or the wrath of God will come upon you. Repent and turn from your sins so that you might be saved. That is prophetic preaching. That God will not tolerate sin. God hates sin. God will not allow sinful behavior among his people without recompense, without something being done about it. Okay? Now, that 1 Peter 1.19, I want us to go to real quick. Uh, it says this. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but is made manifest in the last times for the sake of you. That sure way of prophecy that he was talking about, because uh, in 2 Peter, 2 Peter 1.19, I, I read the wrong book of Peter. But that, that is what it's talking about, that the prophecy of what is going to happen through Jesus Christ. But uh, 2 Peter 1.19 is this, if I can get this page to turn, get these thin little pages to separate. And we have the prophetic word from fully, more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, speaking the gospel of Jesus Christ prophetically that the prophets and their words will be fulfilled in and around Christ and the speaking of the Holy Spirit. So, that being said, what, what does that tell us in light of this First John passage? It says there will be antichrists. I tell you that because I want you to remember, and I've said this before, we've got to be very careful when we hear something to make sure that it's true. Unfortunately, many times we get excited about something we hear and we repeat it only to find out it wasn't true. Wasn't true. For, for years, years, there were rumors Every time you turn around, there's a rumor, Charlie Pride died. Be all over Facebook. Rest in peace, Charlie Pride. Well, he wasn't dead. <laughs> he didn't die. He wasn't dead. He kept on living. He wasn't dead. Somebody started a rumor, and next thing you know, everybody's putting on Facebook, Charlie Pride died. So then this last few months, when he did die, I didn't believe it. That's <laughs> a boy crying wolf. I said, Charlie Pride didn't die. I've been reading those posts for years. People have been saying for years Charlie Pride died. Two or three days later, I find out he did die. But see, that's what happens when we preach something that's not true. 
When we allow ourselves to be caught up in the moment of something emotionally and we say something that we hear without checking it out, we end up passing on a falsehood. And when we do that, we are not following the will of God to love our neighbor as ourself and love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength because we are going outside of that to do something that makes us feel good. Knowledge we have that we can share with someone makes us feel good about ourselves. Again, I'm not knocking people that have said that Smith Wigglesworth made that prophecy. I'm not knocking that. We've all, many times, we have said those things that someone told us and we thought they were true. I'm just saying from from the, the words of the man, the only man alive that would know for sure, it never happened. And we've got to be careful that we don't continue preaching things that we don't know for sure they're factual. That's why we have got to stay close to the Word of God in everything we preach. We have to be careful what we take from other men to preach. We have to preach the Word of God. That's why what I do in my life and have done in my life does not negate my calling from God to preach once I have repented of those things because if I stay close to the Word of God, that is still the truth regardless of how bad I may be. David, King David, was a terrible father, a terrible husband. He was a terrible king when he wasn't at war. But God said he was a man after my own heart. A flawed man like David could lead the children of Israel, chosen by God. And so there he also uses flawed people, us, to do his will on this earth. So we can preach the gospel, but we have to check it out. We have to make sure that what we're preaching is the true gospel of Jesus Christ from the word of God, not from a man that told you something that somebody else may have said. We gotta check those things out. We gotta make sure that they are said in reality and not a falsehood. This even goes further because there are those now that say, you can go find your own truth. You can go seek out your own truth. Yeah, sure, Jesus might be what you need, but I need to find out what is my Jesus. That's not the way it works, folks. You don't get to go pick and choose your truth. You don't get to go pick and choose the gospel. You don't go pick and choose Jesus. What God's word says is what is true, period, and plain. So the Antichrist, what does it say? They are the ones that say there is no Jesus. They deny Jesus is the Christ. They deny the Father and the Son. And so if people start saying in any way that there is any other way to heaven but Jesus Christ, when Jesus said in, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me. Anyone that denies that or does not follow along with that is blaspheming. They are part of the spirit of the Antichrist on this earth. They're not the Antichrist that's going to take over and run the whole world and, and then torture people during the tribulation if you believe a literal translation of the book of Revelation and many of the things that we've heard and been taught all of our lives and we, we believe to be true, that, that's not what it's saying. It's not saying that guy's the Antichrist, but someone that preaches anti what Jesus said about the Father and the Son being one. And the one that does not abide in them and that truth, they are within them the spirit of Antichrist. That's what this is saying. Anything that supposedly gets you to heaven except Jesus Christ and a relationship with him, that is antichrist. And those that preach it are antichrist. You know, it goes further to say that they, they went out from us. In other words, these are many of these people are Christians. They're theologians. They go out from the Christian mainstream only to go farther and farther and farther away from the true gospel of Jesus Christ, stretching it farther and farther and farther to where it is so watered down that it means nothing. And it is away from everything that Jesus himself taught, away off that which you cannot tie to the word of God. And so they, it says that they were never really with us. 
Remember we talked about wolves in sheep's clothing? People that look like and sound like and act like they're one of us, but then what they preach and the way they act and the things they do, that's just way out yonder. It doesn't hold to the Word of God. And if it doesn't, then they are not of us, and they actually never were. They claim to be Christians, but they have been deceived by the world into these other crazy beliefs. We've talked about those beliefs in the last few weeks. We've been uh, listening to them over the last several years try to convince us that the words the Bible says that would be indicative of us being against abortion or against um, believing that homosexuality is not of God, that it's not a, an acceptable lifestyle, it's not an acceptable thing in the eyes of God. The Bible talks about it never in a good light. It never talks about that kind of a, a, a loving, monogamous relationship between two people of consenting age being okay. Never talks about that. If it was okay, it would say it was okay. It's not because it never talks about it in a good light ever. It always talks about it as being sin, as being wrong, as being part of a fallen world. We're bound to the things we're drawn to in our sinful flesh. By nature, we are sinful. By nature, we want to sin. And it is God who through his Holy Spirit draws us to him away from that into repentance. And if we don't do that, then we are being drawn away by the world and deceived. And God's word tells us that though they speak of that, they were never really with us. They've been pulled away. That doesn't mean you can lose your salvation, but you can be deceived in two ways. You can be deceived into thinking that you're a Christian and you're not because you go off and do these other things that you know are not right, but you've been convinced by deception that you've been lied to all these years that God's word is not real, that God's word is, doesn't say what it says and mean what it says. And you can go off and do whatever you want to. You can be deceived in that way. Or you can be deceived in such a way that once you are saved, you can go the direction of easy grace, free grace, that says, I can just do whatever I want to. It don't matter. There's plenty of grace to abound. But Paul said, how can we continue in sin, those of us who are dead to it? We just keep sinning so that we get more grace and more grace. Hey, let's just keep on piling up grace. Heaven forbid. That's what Paul said. Jesus said to repent. That's a 180 degree turn from the way we used to be, which is sin, to the way he wants us to be, which is the other direction. God is not slow as some would, call, would count slowness, but he's patient. That none would perish, but all would come to repentance. That means a complete turning around of the way they were. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if anyone's in Christ, he's a new creature. Everything old is put away and everything's made new. You can't keep going the way you used to be and be in an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. So you can be deceived as a Christian that will keep you from being in an abiding, growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Either way, we've got to come back to Jesus Christ. We've got to come back to him and be purified, be um, uh, reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, it says that we have heard all of this. This is not new, is what he's saying. This is not new. We have heard this from the beginning. We have heard these things from the beginning to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself, to trust God, to quit trusting the world, to not be a friend of the world. That makes enmity with God or you're an enemy of his or on the other side. You said, if, you, if you're, you're either for me or against me, you can't be a friend of the world. And so we have this theology that has been built around the idea that we can still just do whatever we want to do. That's not true. We are called to holiness. We are called to whatever we can muster within ourselves of faith given to us by the Holy Spirit to trust Jesus Christ. Folks, the world that we're in is a crazy, crazy, ridiculous world. We're being told all kinds of crazy things. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is calling us to something bigger. Something better than the world has to offer. And he's calling us to salvation through Jesus Christ into a relationship with God.
the Father who made it possible for all of us through the blood of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to be sons of God, to be his children. He's not going to call us to that, to spoil us and our fun. That's not his point. That's not his purpose. He created us. He knows what is best for us. He knows what we're to be like. And that's what he's calling us to. He knows what will be best for us and that's what he's wanting us to live out in our life. An abiding relationship with him. Not drawn away by the world. Not drawn away by the spirit of Antichrist. Not be drawn away in deception by false teachings or false prophecies. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of guys out there preaching. There's a lot of guys out there sharing on Facebook and Instagram and everything like that. You have to be very, very careful, guys. And I tell you this because I love you. Be very, very careful how you prophesy things. Because the, the Bible is very plain about false prophets. And if you're saying things and claiming them to be prophecy that do not happen... That makes us false prophets. I'm not claiming about anything that might happen in the future. I'm telling you, there are those who for whatever reason, and I don't know what it would be, have made up things that great men of the faith said when in reality they did not say those things. Be careful not to repeat those things. Be careful not to preach that. There are people out there that would want you to understand that it's all right. You can believe in that God or that God or this religion or that religion and this religion and that religion. They're all the same. We're all, we're all headed the same place. We're just getting there by different avenues, different directions. It's all just a whole bunch of different views, like, like tributaries that all work their way down to the ocean. Sounds a whole lot like Adam and Eve in the garden. When devil came up to Eve and he said, did God say that if you ate that you would die? I don't think you'll die. And so Eve ate it. She didn't die right then. The devil said, see, you didn't die. And Eve goes, hey, Adam, check it out. I ate this. I didn't die. And snickering and hateful, the devil slinks away, patting himself on the back that he had deceived man into the fall in a half-truth. Because from that moment forward, death entered the world for everything and everybody. So when the devil comes to you and says, ah, oh, there's a bunch of ways to get to heaven. There's all kinds of ways to get to heaven. Just, just seek it out. You can do whatever you want to do. Find your own truth. Folks, there is no such thing as your own truth. There is one truth, and that's Jesus Christ. If you've never trusted him as your Lord and Savior, today is the day of salvation. Won't you do that? The Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The world does not have the answers. The world is clueless of the answers. It's proven it for thousands and thousands of years of civilization. The world has proven that it's clueless. You look at one political party or the other for your answers, they've both been on the wrong side of history so many times they should not have any credibility left. The news media, celebrities, <laughs> yeah, right. We should believe them. What kind of credibility could they possibly have left? God is the only one who has never, ever changed. He said, I am the Lord your God and I do not change. I change not. So from the beginning of time, what he said was wrong is still wrong. What he told us to do from the beginning of time is still what we need to be doing. And the whole book of 1 John is about loving each other. 
enough to believe, follow, and preach the truth. Because if the if we don't believe in God, if we don't believe in Jesus, but we say we are we know the truth, we're lying. We don't know the truth. And the truth is not in us. Only Jesus Christ. That's the truth. If you're here this morning and you're listening to this broadcast and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, please contact us and let us help you understand how that takes place in your life if you don't already know. It's very simple. You can pray right here while you're listening. You can say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've done wrong. I know I was born in sin just like everybody else was, and I know that I need a Savior because of that because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And I know that God demonstrated his love for us when he let Jesus Christ die on the cross to atone for those sins. And if I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is everything he says he is in God's word, and I believe in my heart, not just say the words, but believe in my heart that God has raised him from the dead, I will be saved. God save me. And the Bible says in, in Romans 10, 9, 10, and then in 13, it says, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, and it means in that manner, to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. You can do that this morning. You can go to jeffgore.org, and we have phone number and P.O. box and email and all the kind of information. Now you can get hold of us to talk to us or question uh, anything. I don't have all the answers, but God's Word has all the answers, and we can find them together. And I'd love to be able to do that with you if you would call us. If you have prayer requests, if anything that we can pray for you, um, please let us know. Uh, I have a dear friend that many of you on Facebook know, Greg Black, who got a new kidney this week. Praise the Lord. He got a new kidney nine years on dialysis. And he got a new kidney this week. He's doing well in that hospital. Last we heard yesterday, he's doing great. And I'm going to try to call him this week and talk to him and visit with him. And what, what, a, what a time of praise that will be because we've been praying for him that God would give him a new kidney. Pray for the family of the one that that kidney came from because unfortunately, the donor uh, situation in this, in this country, I believe is a good one. I believe that if you choose to be a donor, you should do that. You should do that if you want to. But it's also very difficult to know that someone loses someone so that you might live. And that's, that's hard. So let's pray for Greg. Praise the Lord that he got a new kidney. Pray for him when, it, when those things go through his mind because he, he talks about that. He thinks about that. But at the same time, help that family of the person that they lost that provided that kidney. Give them peace. Help Pray that God will give them peace and comfort and assurance that God took care of them in those last moments. And even though that terrible, bad thing happened, whatever it was that they lost their life, God turned it around like Romans 8, 28 says, that everything works together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purpose. God takes those terrible things the world throws at us, those terrible things the devil throws at us, and he makes something good come out of it. When you're going through those trials and tribulations, understand this. Trust God to get through them. And there will come a day when you will meet someone that's going through the same trial, the same tribulation, and you will be able to pray with them and say, I know exactly what you're talking about. I have no idea what it would be like to have to get a, a new organ transplant or to, to um, die and someone get your organs or, you, you know, the fact that you lost someone whose organs were donated. You know, if this was an organ that was voluntarily donated by a donor that said, hey, I'm at, so give it to him. Sometimes they have a tougher time getting over the surgery than the person that got the new kidney, <laughs> you know. So even in that case, even in that case, we need to pray for the person that donated that kidney and their family and their friends. If you've got people that you'd like to pray for, I can't mention everybody on here that needs prayer. That would take forever, and you don't want to listen to all of those other things like that. But share those things with us, and we'll pray for them. We'll pray for them, and we'll make sure that you know we pray for them, and then we'll seek out what the results are of the prayer. So join us next week, the same place, same time, 10 o'clock, Central Time, here on uh, Facebook. We'll have a recorded message next week. 
uh, that we are going to be recording this week at a special event, and we'll broadcast it next week. And so uh, we hope that you'll join us. Look at our schedule on our website, jeffgore.org, and if we're someplace where you're going to be, come see us. We'd love to have you. As we leave today, remember this, that God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He wants to be a friend of yours, not at enmity with you. So don't be a friend of the world. Be a friend of the Father in heaven because it's through Jesus Christ that we can have that relationship. Thanks for watching. We love you. God loves you. Hope that you join us next week. Thank you.